Aloha, my name is Julie Mitchell. I am the Executive Director here at Kuikahi Mediation Center. Welcome to our Finding Solutions Growing Peace Brown Bag Lunch Series. For many of you, you've been to these Zoom talks before, and some of these, it's your first time. So to tell you a little bit about us, Kuikahi is a nonprofit community mediation center. We serve East Hawaii on the Big Island or Hawaii Island in the state of Hawaii. We have our speaker here from Canada, so that's very exciting, and I know other people are coming from around the planet. Kuikahi was founded back in 1983 three as a program of the Island of Hawaii YMCA, and we've been our own independent nonprofit since 2006. So last year was our 40th birthday, which was very exciting. Our mission, to empower people to come together, to talk and to listen, to explore options and to find their own best solutions. And to achieve this mission, we offer mediation, facilitation, and training, like today's talk, to strengthen the ability of diverse individuals and groups to resolve interpersonal conflicts and community issues. This brown bag lunch series is held every third Thursday at 12 noon on Zoom, and you have to register each time on Eventbrite to get the Zoom link. I'm pleased to announce that our next speaker on February 15th is Jill Raznov. She will be speaking on the topic mindfulness in conflict resolution, awareness, creativity, and openness. I will put the link to register in the chat. And also let you know about another exciting opportunity. Once a year, we offer our annual basic mediation training. So if you would like to be in Hilo or are in Hilo, it's starting on Friday, February 24th. It's two Friday Saturdays consecutively. So February 23rd, 24th, March 1st and 2nd. It's an interactive training. It is perfect if you want to increase your communication, problem solving, de-escalating type of skills. And it is also how our volunteer mediators get their start. They take this training and then they join our apprenticeship program and then they join our pool of professionally trained volunteer mediators. If that sounds like something you might be interested in, I will put the link also in the chat so you can click in and learn more about that. At the end of today's talk, I, we are going to ask you to fill out a short survey. We put it in the chat box and we you can click into it. It helps with our grant funding for this free series. Please do take a minute to give us your thoughts. We are also always looking for new presenters. So if you or someone you know might be a presenter, please also send me those suggestions. I will send an email out later with today's slides and the video recording and the survey link because we have found that a couple people sometimes can't click on the survey link for some reason from their Zoom chat box. Okay, enough about that. Time to talk about our topic and our speaker. Our topic today is resolving conflict with humor seriously. And our speaker, speaker is Dr. Anita Dorjak. I hope I'm not mutilating your last name. Um, she is a Canadian lawyer, mediator, and trainer who has over 30 years of experience in dispute resolution. She has provided workshops and presented internationally at legal and non-legal conferences in Europe, Australia, and North and South America. That's actually how I met Anita at the ABA Dispute Resolution Conference uh, last spring in Vegas. And she holds a PhD in semiotics and the theater from the University of Alberta. She's fluent in three languages and is insatiable in her search for avant-garde methods to settle conflicts. So I'm ready to laugh, are you? Let's please welcome Anita. Hello, good afternoon to all of you. And thank you so much, Julie, for inviting me. I'm very excited to be with all of you. I will be much more excited having been where you are because it's minus 40 here for a few days. We had horrible temperatures, but I hope to bring some warmth to you and some laughs so we can learn a different way of looking at conflict. And hopefully I will invite you to uh, reflect and perhaps introduce some of these uh, tips into your mediation and negotiation discussions with your clients and with each other. So I'm going to talk today about uh, humor 
And uh, a couple of things before I start, I will be playing a few videos. The first video, very much at the beginning, uh, is uh, has a fairly low volume. So if you will have some issues hearing, please kindly turn up the volume on your computer, iPad, phone, whatever you are on. Uh, so that would be great. The other thing is I will have some tricky questions for you. Uh, sometimes I call them quizzes. So if we get to the quiz and there is a question and if you answer, I'm going to ask Julie for kind assistance to just read some of the answers from the chat so we can all kind of giggle together and hopefully, you know, discover the right and the serious answer to, to the quiz. So I think that's enough for at the beginning and I will now uh, take you to my presentation, which is about humor in mediation. And I have this um, bar here. We'll have to just fix that a little bit, uh, what you are going to see. And uh, please uh, confirm for me that you see the slide with Mr. Pinocchio and the judge. <laughs> there is no way. Okay. <laughs> I hope that Julie will let me know if there is any issue with whatever I'm going to be showing you. But um, it I, looks good. Looks good. Thank you so much. It's it's great to hear the voice from far away and telling me that yes, you can see what I can see. Okay. All right. So sometimes um, we kind of feel like we are sitting where the judge is sitting, right? And we're looking at our clients and we see these longer noses growing. And well, sometimes they are really growing, right? From our experience. Hello to all of you in different languages and mahalo for having me with you today. I think that life is really too important to be taken seriously. I totally agree with Mr. Wild. And uh, sometimes as mediators, I think we may feel like this. And it says his last remaining negotiating tool and I think all of us probably got to the point when we felt like rock, paper, scissors because people are at impasse and they cannot really resolve what they are talking about. In any event, we are talking about humor. So what is humor? And let's look at very learned dictionaries. So Oxford and Cambridge, and they talk about humor, defining it as a quality or ability to find something amusing or being amusing. And when we think about humor and the etymology of the word, we go all the way back to antiquity, to ancient Greece. And Dr. Hippocrates was saying that humor actually refers to the balance between different humors within the body. So what can humor do to our bodies? Well, we will discover that it has any impact on our bodies or not, because I think that Dr. Hippocrates was into something in the past. But before I take you there to look if there are any benefits, let's get serious, okay? And I, what I mean by that is, well, humor actually has been studied. When I became interested in humor a few good years ago, I didn't realize that it could be studied from so many different perspectives. So, you know, it's psychology, anthropology, sociology, medicine, nursing, all of these disciplines would look at humor and study some aspects of it that they have find and have found and are finding useful and helpful in their own practice. So before we start with the lighter side of my presentation, let's just look at humor theories. And this is the video that I was warning about at the beginning. This is a video that I did for the presentation about humor theories. So the volume may be a little bit low. Please kindly crank it up on your devices. And please join me in traveling back in time to discover the theories of humor. I'll see you on the other side. Ladies and gentlemen, what follows is a very serious part of my presentation. I will be addressing theories of humor. There are three main theories. Number one, superiority theory. Number two, incongruity theory. And number three, release theory. Let me start with the superiority theory. We will all need to go back in time. Are you ready to board our time machine? Great. Here we go, all the way to the ancient Greece. We see the beautiful white temples, olive groves, we smell oranges and feel the warmth of the sun. We also encounter one of the most famous philosophers, Plato. It is the fifth century BC. Plato 
viewed humor as malicious and abusive. It is surprising, isn't it? He suggested that laughter, or laughable people, consider themselves as better and wealthier than others. Um, and um, in other words, they consider themselves superior. So in his Republic, Plato discussed the negative consequences of abandoning ourselves to violent laughter. And he went as far as to say that literature should be rewritten and edited to delete any mention of gods or any heroes that might be overcome with laughter. Well, another famous Greek, Aristotle, also regarded humor as a form of abuse. But unlike Plato, he believed that a little tasteful laughter is a desirable thing. So, however, he cautioned uh, that those who go into excess in making themselves appear to be buffoons and vulgar, that was not good. So, according to Aristotle, laughter was, was good, um, just a little bit of it, and uh, the laughter of the virtuous person uh, should be moderate and should be tactful. Now, uh, let's board our time machine again. Ready? Seatbelt fastened? Great. We are now traveling to Derbyshire, England. The year is 1651. And the man we meet is the philosopher Thomas Hobbes. He builds upon Plato's and Aristotle's notion that laughter is associated with superiority over others. In one of the best known and most quoted uh, passages on humor literature, Hobbes states that laughter is the expression of a sudden glory arising from some sudden conception of some eminency in ourselves by comparison with the infirmity of others. So laughter, according to the superiority theory of humor, gives us pleasure as we recognize the foolishness of others and we believe that we are much wiser uh, and, and laughter results from perceiving infirmities in others, which reinforce our own sense of superiority. So many jokes are told at the expense of people who come from different ethnic backgrounds. For example, Italian jokes as told by Irish Americans, Irish jokes as told by the English, or Portuguese jokes as told by the Brazilians, or Newfies jokes uh, by other Canadians, etc. So here is one uh, about two Scottish nuns, and this is from the book uh, entitled Humor, a very short introduction. It goes like this. Two Scottish nuns are traveling to the United States. One of the sisters tells the other, you know, in America, they eat dogs. Their plane lands in JFK and they take a taxi to Manhattan. No sooner do they get settled into their convent than they take a walk. Seeing a hot dog stand, they order two hot dogs. The first sister takes hers out of the wrapping, looks at it and asks the other nun, what part did you get? Aha, uh -huh. <laughs> so laughter, according to the superiority theory of humor, um, gives us that pleasure at the discovery of the discrepancy. It's time to leave England, ready? Okay, it's time to move to Germany. We are entering the times of the Enlightenment and the idea that humor is based on incongruity and the comic amusement comes from the apprehension of that incongruity. And this is the approach that was taken by Immanuel Kant um, and also Arthur Schopenhauer. Kant in his critique of uh, judgment states, laughter is an affection arising from the sudden transformation of a strained expectation into nothing. And he illustrates this with a story. An Indian at the table of an Englishman in Surat, a city in India, when he saw a bottle of ale opened and all the beer turned into froth and overflowing, testified his great astonishment with many exclamations when the Englishman asked him, what is there in this to astonish you so much? 
he answered, ah, I'm not at all astonished that it would flow out, but I do wonder how you ever got it in. So Kant um, located this incongruity between the expectation and our experience. Arthur Schopenhauer located it between our sense of perception of things and an abstract rational knowledge of these same things. So for Schopenhauer, humor arises when we suddenly notice the incongruity between a concept and a perception that are supposed to be the same thing. So he, for example, comments on a joke um, and this is the German talking about an Austrian who is supposed to be, well, not as good as the German. So he says, when someone had declared that he was fond of walking alone, an Austrian said to him, quote, you like walking alone, so do I. Therefore, we can go together. And uh, Schopenhauer explains that a pleasure which two love they can enjoy in common subsumes under it the very case which excludes community. So from Germany, let us, no, no, no more time machine. Uh, let us just simply move by horse carriage all the way northeast from Germany. And where do we end up? In Denmark and in Copenhagen, to be precise. And who's there? Soren Kierkegaard, existentialist philosopher who perceived humor as a disparity between what is expected and what is being experienced. Thus, the meaning of incongruity in different versions of the incongruity theory is that something or event we perceive violates our standard norms, our standard expectations. So, question, have you read Don Quixote de la Mancha? Do you remember the lovely, very thin knight Don Quixote and his servant uh, Sancho Panza with the big panza? Or do you remember enjoying the movies with Laurel and Hardy? Or remember the movies uh, with Charlie Chaplin when he uses a tablecloth as a handkerchief? Well, let me illustrate with the following joke. Um, from the uh, book Understanding Philosophy Through Jokes. And now all of the lawyers who are listening here, beware. It's, uh, the book is really seriously funny. Okay, here's the joke. A blonde is sitting next to a lawyer on an airplane. The lawyer keeps bugging her to play a game with him, uh, which will show who has more general knowledge. So finally, he says he will offer her 10 to 1 odds. Every time she doesn't know the answer to one of his questions, she will pay him $5. Every time he doesn't know the answer to one of her questions, he will pay her 50 bucks. So she agrees to play and he asks her, what is the distance from the earth to the nearest star? Well, she says nothing, just hands him a $5 bill. So then she asks him, what goes up a hill with three legs and comes down with four legs? The lawyer thinks for a long time, but in the end, he has to concede that he has no idea. So he hands her $50. The blonde puts the money in her purse without a comment. So the lawyer says, well, wait, wait a minute. What's the answer to the question? Without a word, she hands him $5. Uh -huh. Okay, so it's time to now leave um, the Enlightenment and, um, well, just last flight uh, through time on a board. It's a short flight and it's to, um, it's to Vienna, it's to Austria. And can you guess who we are going to meet? Um, well, Yes, it's Professor Sigmund Freud. And Sigmund Freud um, elaborated on humor in two of his works, two publications. One was the book called Jokes and the Relation, sorry, Jokes and Their Relation to the Unconscious, which was published in 1905 originally, and then a short paper simply entitled Humor, which was published in 1928. So um, Freud and his view of humor 
was really very influential in psychological humor research during the first half of the 20th century. In his book on the psychology of humor, the Canadian uh, researcher, Professor Martin, uh, explains that the purpose of laughter, according to Freud, is to release excess nervous energy. And in this view, an energy that has built up in our nervous system is no longer needed. It must be released in some way, and laughter is one way to do it. So according to Freud, the reason we enjoy jokes so much is that they enable us to experience for a moment the illicit pleasure derived from releasing some of our primitive sexual and aggressive impulses. We do not really feel guilty about this because our superego, our conscience, is temporarily distracted by the clever cognitive trick included in the joke. So then Professor Martin gives us the following joke. Mr. Brown and Mrs. Brown are talking. Mr. Brown, this is disgusting. I just found out that the janitor has made love to every woman in the building except one. His wife says, oh, it must be that stuck up Mrs. Johnson on the second floor. Okay. All right. The theories of humor. Now, let us all get back. To the now. Right, so now back to the now and three theories of humor superiority, incongruity, and release theory. Here's another take on release theory, and it says, You say I should own my own feelings, but my accountant says it would be smarter to lease them. Hmm. You know, humor has been defined in different ways. So sometimes in the research on humor, humor is regarded as communication. Sometimes it may be a message that is nonverbal, like a cartoon. Sometimes it's just a pleasurable affect that is accompanied by laughter. So that brings us to the first quiz. And the quiz is about curious facts about humor. So I will have the following questions for you. Number one, what is the funniest animal? Number two, how many times a day do we laugh? And number three, how many days, sorry, how many times do children laugh per day? So if you would be kind enough to put please in the chat your answers, what is the funniest animal? And I would invite Julie to please read out whatever you see for a few seconds so we can all have a Google. Julie, if you see anything, please share with us. Hawaiian monk seal. Emu, cats, sloth, humans, monkey, hyena, platypus, penguin, naked mole, rat, duck-billed platypus. Stop, stop, stop. I think somebody hit it. Okay. Somebody got it right. Okay. I'll keep you in suspense. Okay. Answers to question number two. How many times a day do we laugh? Put the number. How many times a day? And Julie, please read out some answers. Thank 20, you. 20, 10, 7, 11, 57, 8, not enough, 123. Stop. I love not enough. Let's fix it. All of us should fix Six. it. Not enough. Okay. Now, again, somebody got the right answer. I'll keep you in suspense. Question number two. How often do children laugh per day? Again, answers. Julie. 102, 100, 200, 30. More than adults, 88, they don't stop, 300. Stop, stop, thank you. I, I hear some of you have kids. <laughs> Constant. <laughs> All right, perfect, here come the answer. Okay, Mr. Duck, and I don't mean Donald Duck, but just the duck, apparently is the funniest animal. How many times per day do we love the adults? Well, the studies say 15 to 20, I heard 20. Uh, and how often do children laugh? Look at that. Somebody said never stop. Yeah, almost 300 times a day. Let's look at this kiddo here because he's quite adorable.
baby. Yeah, then, <coughs> excuse me, a baby, but me laughing. So does humor help us? Well, believe it or not, there are studies that say yes, and in so many different aspects. So it makes us more productive after taking a little break that is humorous. And look at that number, 39%. We should be taking all that breaks, right? And often. Now, the humor also decreases stress and just, just anticipating that something funny will happen. Does that to us? Okay, twice decrease, okay? That's big. And then also increases our memory recall. When we watch funny videos, how many times? By 23%, remarkable. And this is all solid science from the Association for the Applied and Therapeutic Humor. Let's hear Mr. Bacon, what does he say? Well, imagination, lovely, was given to us, well, to compensate us for what we are not. But humor, mm, yeah, for what we are. So are there any benefits to laughter? Well, let's define it first. What is laughter? Well, it's, again, the action, dictionary say, well, it's an action of sound, of, of act of sound of laughing. And I love the cartoon because it says that Nesby always has his agendas very clear. So hmm, let's look at the benefits of laughter. What does it do? Well, it's good for our heart, okay? Why? Because it lowers our blood pressure. Our blood gets more oxygen. And of course, when that happens, we relax. But really, there's more than that. So let's look at a quick video about the best. Ever hear that laughter is the best medicine? Well, it's true. Research shows that laughing is a powerful remedy for stress, pain, and social conflict. It can even make you more attractive. When you laugh, your chest muscles and diaphragm contract, forcing air over your vocal cords to create the rhythmic sound of laughter. <laughs> your heart beats faster, and the inner lining of your blood vessels dilates, which increases blood flow and sends more oxygen to the rest of your body. You may laugh so hard you cry, or even pee a little. Laughter also triggers the release of endorphins, the body's natural feel-good chemicals, which can help relieve pain. In fact, laughter has been shown to ease feelings of depression and anxiety by reducing stress hormones like cortisol and epinephrine. But the best part about laughing? It brings you closer to those around you, especially the opposite sex. Research suggests that women are attracted to men who make them laugh, while men are attracted to women who think they're funny. <laughs> so giggle a little and laugh a lot. You'll feel better, and that's no joke. Every well, something to keep in mind, what women think about men and gentlemen, beware, and I hope you listened well. And <laughs> for the ladies, there was also advice there. Now, Mr. Cousins, interesting story. You can read the quote. He wrote a book about how laughter was helping him with pain. He was diagnosed with an incurable kind of disease uh, regarding his spine. He actually outlived his doctors and he ultimately died 20 some years later <laughs> when he was expected to die. So outlived probably some of his doctors and died of a heart problem, not related to the original diagnosis. But the issue is the pain. A lot of us do suffer pain for whatever reason and there's there is a medicine. And again, the book is great. So should we laugh or should we jog? And again, I will invite Julie to help me here with the chat. So 20 seconds of laughing, what do you think it's equal to? Is it equal to five minutes of jogging, 20 seconds of jogging, or 180 seconds of jogging? Who thinks it's A? Do you see any A? I've got, I've got one, two, one A. Okay, what about two B? Two A's, three A. A's, B's, I've got about three or four B's. Okay, what about C? I've got a little bit more C's, though more things are coming in now. I would say that's evenly divided over them all from what I'm seeing. Okay, here is the right answer. The right answer is this. So think about this. I don't have a beach, but you have a beautiful, beautiful beaches everywhere. You can just jog for three minutes or just simply laugh for 20 seconds, whatever you find easier. But that's the benefit of laughter. Okay, Mr. Moliere, Monsieur? Ah, okay, the duty of comedy is to correct men by amusing them. Indeed. Let's look at how we can be amused. Or shall we be amused? Humor styles? Yes, believe it or not. They have been studied and there are four of them. So before we get there, another quiz. And what is this quiz about? Okay, here are the following humor styles. Collaborative, yes or no? Julie, is there any yeses or no's in the chat that this is a humor style? Can you guess? Is there any yeses? 
All yeses. All yeses. You are all wrong. I'm so sorry to say. I wish I could see your faces. If I were live with you, we would have such a good laugh together. But anyway, you're wrong. I'm so sorry. Anyway, compromising. Is that a humor style? Yes or no? Julie, what do you see? All no's. All no's. All right. Okay. What about aggressive? Yes or oh, no? And yes and a maybe. Okay. Here's another one. Okay, well, this is the last one. I will not torture you anymore. Aggressive. Is this a humor style? Yes or no? Uh, all yeses. Oh, there's a no. Mostly yeses. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, a lot of you are right. Thank you very much for participating. Seriously, yes, there are humor styles, and there are four of them. So there's affiliative humor, self-enhancing, aggressive, and self-defeating. Let's just look at them quickly. So affiliative humor, well, it's to you know, improve the relationships with other people. So these are the people who come to the party and laugh and make other people laugh and they are jolly and nice to be with. So that's affiliative humor. What does it do? Well, it helps us in the relationship building, right? And it also creates environment that is positive. So it's nice to be with these people. Here's a joke. Hmm. And people on the islands, please beware. I'm not in danger with that. <laughs> but anyway, carrying on, self-enhancing humor. What's the aim of this? Well, to kind of focus on oneself and how well, how we perceive life and how we see what happens around us. And when we are getting down depressed, when you use this kind of humor, you actually will live longer. There are studies that say that it predicts longevity. It also correlates with high self-esteem. So it's good for us. What about self in, uh, oh, what does it do for others around us? Well, it helps us that build better teams it also enhances our creativity and it reduces stress for us okay so that's self-enhancing humor now what about this okay corporate ladder mm -hmm. kids aside all right next kind of humor aggressive you are right aggressive humor well it's to enhance the self okay but at the expense of other people so that includes all of this bad humor that the philosophers were writing about it's teasing, it's ridiculing others. So what does it do? Well, of course, it shows that I'm better than you. So it demonstrates status. It, it of, of course, belittles others. And it's not good for the relationships and our culture and teams. So not good. But here's, uh, here's a take on it. I'd like to hire you. No more room at the bottom. You can see that. And finally, there's this sense of humor, self, that style of humor, self-defeating. And this is to enhance the relationship at the expense of the self. So these are the people who kind of are able to laugh at themselves, to say something funny, maybe in the mediation, maybe in a negotiation, something to put others at ease. So uh, what does it do? Well, it helps build relationships and improves them. It lowers the status. People who are like that are more approachable. And here's another little joke. Can you, mm -mm. okay, well, some of us might have been doing it actually <laughs> in the time of Zoom. Is there anybody doing it now? <clears throat> okay. All right, here is Mr. Famous Actor going home. Okay, at age 15. However, there are studies about bosses and employees. That's another conversation, but I included this one because it's, I'm sure there are some bosses uh, on this call listening. So when the boss uses humor in the workplace, what happens? Well, look at that. It's good to use it. You will have employees who are more satisfied, maybe more creative. They will be performing better. So definitely good thing to use, right? Humor. Now, what about mediation? Hmm. Okay, let me invite you to look at that. Hmm. I don't have custody of the kids. You know what? Yeah. I don't get custody. It has been insane, pathetic joke. But right what now, I've had to go right now, she doesn't know where the kids are. Do not talk about me as a mother. At I'm home? so sick to death of you talking hey, about me sisters? as a mother and what where? I've done They're wrong. Probably at a firehouse somewhere. Do not talk about firehouse. that. I am you know? sick of you accusing you me home? of not being a good mother. Seven years, I've been Some a good mother. Just remember mother, when we went out. Just remember, I had upturn a bench. Don't you fucking talk about me being a mother. I hate you. Hey, I got an idea. Why don't you just kiss my left nut? I told you this was a bad idea. You know what, Ken? The bad idea would be to let your client walk out of here today and drag this thing out for another year, wasting more time and wasting more money. The only good idea is to let me and John do our job and mediate this thing right here. You want to hear the crazy thing? I know it doesn't feel like it, but we're making progress. Mm -hmm. 
We settled the deal with the cars. Let's see, that takes us to frequent flyer miles. We're flying. Those are mine. I want them. You know what we're going to do? We're going to split them right down the middle. How'd that be, Mr. Kroger? It would be n not good at all. I earned those miles. Yeah, you earned them flying to Denver to meet your whore. Oh, Lord. Well, she's not afraid to express herself sexually, if that's what you mean. She is a stripper, for God's sake. She is not. Her name is Chastity. She is white trash. Same as you. Ill Billy. That's it. Go comatose for me, baby. You shut your mouth when you're talking to me. Hold it. This is getting confusing. You didn't always hate each other. There had to be some nice moments during the courtship, maybe? Or the wedding? The wedding had to be fun. You, you get the decorations, families, families coming together. That's a nice moment. What'd you have to eat? Crab cakes. Are you kidding me? Crab cakes? Crab I do cakes. not have a good time eating crab, crab cakes. cakes. I love them. And They're you phenomenal. Did you have a band? Yeah. Good or bad? Who gives a shit? It's a great band. It's a bad band. It's like pizza, baby. It's That's good no matter true. what. There's music in you the get air. Them playing, shout, yeah. Hey, a little bit oh, 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 hey, 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 shout hey, now. Hey, Jump up and shout now. It's a good time. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Rubbing up against each other. Just a couple of kids who like the fuck trying to make it honest. I get it. Guys, the real enemy here is the institution of marriage. It's not realistic. It's crazy. And don't do this for the other person. It's about saying yes to yourself and saying yes to your future. Say yes. And have some opportunities for yourself. I'm sure you'd love to be free. Maybe go out and meet some Latin guy that can dance, grind up on you, make you feel dangerous but also safe. And how about you? Don't you want to get inside chastity without having to wonder if anyone's going to find out? God, wouldn't that be sweet? Wouldn't that be nice? And have some Latin guy sweating all over you, talking to you in languages you don't understand, needing you, wanting you, taking you? All we're trying to say is... Put your swords away for a second. Let's finish this and let's move on. Get out there and get some strange ass. Could you give her a glass of water so she can take that? Hey, John, that's weird. That glass looks half full to me. Wow. Now that you mention it, it is half full. You can have the miles. Ah, sweetie. You take the miles. Great. Great. Let's sign the paperwork and we are done. These are just semantics. If you guys want to throw a couple miles at us, we'll take a couple. The big thing is, is that we're all moving on. Could you two just not talk anymore? Can you just stop talking? Well, we could just stop now and, you know, have a lovely discussion about what happened, but we have no time now. This is just a brief presentation. If we ever had more time, it would be so much uh, fun and so, so interesting to hear your perspectives on what just happened in that scene, how humor was used, how was it helpful, was it helpful, did it move the, the whole sort of process forward? It would be really interesting, but let's talk about humor and mediation so we can actually get to the bottom of this and my presentation will slowly be coming to an end. So um, what does it do? Well, it actually, as we can see in, the, in, the, um, in this little clip, uh, it changes how things can be seen. It also has an impact on the relationship and it can offer a different point of view. So a few tips on using humor and mediation. Well, definitely avoid the aggressive style of humor. So no sarcasm, no irony, none of this. That's no good. And if you offend somebody, well, be gracious enough to say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it like this, blah, blah, blah. But just acknowledge that something happened that was not good. And this humor is to be used. So think about this. Think about examples of self-deprecating humor and how you can use it in mediation. It would be lovely if I could invite you to maybe put something in the chat you know, if you have an example, a, a phrase that you use that will be self-deprecating and we can maybe save that chat and then share it. So for all of us, for the benefit of everybody who's listening. So that's just an invitation. No pressure. I'm moving on. Here's Mr. Meow. And well, he's not going to give us any better offer, right? It's Jeff and Meow. But well, we know that humor, as we saw in the clip and in life, your experienced mediators, you must have seen some um, displays of humor in your mediations. It definitely introduces a different kind of an atmosphere. It breaks up the tension. It releases stress. There's lots of science behind that. And when people are less stressed, what do they do? They can focus on the issues. It's like in the clip, right? When she's, you can have the miles, honey, or sweetie, whatever he said. 
So what kind of humor to use? Well, actually, we can listen to this psychiatrist, Dr. Goldstone, who lives in LA, wrote the book about listening, and he says that the best humor to use is this, and why? He has an explanation why. So it's not just because I say so, but lots of studies. And he says, why? Because it shows humility. And when you're interacting with people who are humble, okay, people are more likely to be like that, to reciprocate, to open up. So there is another value in this particular style of humor. So why use humor in mediation? Well, it's kind of, we all, I've already touched on that, but this is important to keep in mind, this one, okay? When you're using this kind of humor, people will like you. Okay, so it increases the likability of whoever is displaying this kind of humor. Um, the status, kind of the balance, you know, the, the status of, of the person when you come and you have a lawyer or a mediator, somebody who has a status and people come and they don't understand the process. There is this tension. So when there's a little bit of humor introduced, that tension can dissipate. And it's a good coping uh, mechanism as well. Is there any reason not to use it? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, sometimes um, the people who are working with or, you know, people who you are mediating with or your colleagues may not be into humor at all. And that's OK. This is just one way of looking at conflict, in my view, and it can be quite useful, but not for everybody. The timing must be right. So that's something before you say something. Um, think about the impact of it, and uh, sometimes the jokes don't land very nicely. And of course, if there is a power imbalance because you said something sarcastic, that's not good either. So why not to use? I talked about why to use, why not to use. Now, when? When to use? Well, I will say when you're prepping for meetings, it's during the mediation process. It's during the debrief after, if you have any kind of... Uh, um, debrief with the client or if you co-mediate with your co-mediator. And it's really because of the impact of humor on how we speak, how we relate to each other, it actually will help us achieve settlement. So how, again, how to use it? Well, we have to understand a little bit about the other person's sense of humor. I sometimes ask my client, um, you know, saying, well, if it's uh, in a negotiation setup, um, you know, kind of meeting we work in a team, um, well, tell me a little bit about, you know, your spouse's sense of humor. Um, what would make her laugh? You know, something like that. So we can have it in the back pocket and use it when the time is right. Um, we should also discuss the kind of humor uh, with our clients so to make sure that, you know, we don't do anything that would actually delay or uh, lend us an impasse. Uh, we don't want that. And the good way to do it is to use anecdotes and stories. And I'm sure we have tons of them between all of us. I'm not sure how big the group is, but I think there are quite a few people. And imagine if we all shared a humorous little story, very brief for maybe 20 seconds. And I would do it with you live, but I'm not live, I'm live, but I'm very far away. So uh, we could actually share that experience. That would be very helpful. Um, and I think the positivity and the mood, you know, to smile at people, just to be kind and, you know, my, the smile, that's another, that's another presentation, but uh, I think that's part of what Julie was, uh, was uh, when we met and, and Julie was kind enough to come when I was talking about the face and the smile, that has an impact as well. So in summary, what have I talked about today? Well, I subjected you to a very quiet video about the theories of humor. And there are three of them, right? Okay. The benefits of laughter we discussed as well. There's sound science behind that. And there are humor styles as well. And there are four of them. And I briefly presented them. And you know which one to use, right? Which one to introduce in your negotiations, mediations, in your everyday life. Which one would really be good? And it's that self-deprecating humor. And also some tips about humor in mediation and what to do, what not to do, and why, and when, and how. So this is a brief introduction. This can be much longer, but it's just hopefully something that will invite you to reflect on yet another tool that can be used when you're kind of thinking like, what else can I do? What can I do to help this couple move forward? What can I do to help this dispute 
be resolved and they suggest something. Maybe it's a story. Maybe it's an anecdote. Maybe it's something like that, quite simple, that will introduce some levity and change the perspective and allow all of the people involved in the dispute to come to a what we call the mutually agreeable resolution. So a very warm thank you to all of you, all the way from Alberta, Canada, on the other side of the Pacific, from the other side of the Rocky Mountains. I thank you so much for being here. Um, as Julie was saying in the beginning, uh, whatever you were doing, please come on camera. I'm going to press some magic buttons and stop sharing if I know how to do it, if I don't lose you all, um, stop sharing. And um, here we are. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, everyone. So we are not done yet. You can be done if you really want to leave. However, I have a feeling there's more humor to be had in these last 10 minutes because we like to save, if we can, time at the end for Q&A and comments. If you do have to go on and put the survey uh, in the chat already. Okay, so let me go to the chats first and then we'll see what... what um, what else we have to say? So I have one person saying, don't try to be too funny. Practice before you go into mediation. Any thoughts on that, Anita? Oh, absolutely. There are so many occasions when you have an intention to do something funny, and then you kind of know you have crossed the line and it's too late to take it back. So what you can do is kind of take a deep breath. And what happened? Uh, am I with you? Uh, you yes, I'm sorry. I'm not sure what's happening. I'm going to... Okay. Um, uh, somebody, um, somebody, um, Priscilla, can you help me? Uh, somebody share some technology thing happening. I don't know. Oh, okay. 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 So now, what, were you, what were you saying? I was saying to take a deep breath and to rehearse in your mind for a very, very, let's say two, three, four seconds. What is going to come out of your mouth? Because sometimes these words come out of our mouths and we regret that we said them and uttered them. So um, yes, pause. Pause is good. Pause is okay. You can always smile during the pause. And you know, people will still think, oh, well, she's well-intentioned and can be a kind smile. And you can think in the meantime, what do I say next? And smile. So anything else in the chat? Yeah, one person's asking, how do you handle someone who resents humor? <laughs> don't rub it in <laughs> obviously don't use it but you know you can say you can ask questions I would just invite a friendly conversation you know tell me a little bit more what makes you think that you know maybe it's a person who was um, you know ridiculed when she was much younger maybe it was somebody who was picked on maybe it was somebody who was belittled by um, you know somebody like I had when I, I'm a mediator, but I'm a lawyer, I had been ridiculed by my tall colleagues in court and I would win the case, I would win the case and, you know, just sheepishly walk out and say, I get it, and, you know, you have to just kind of have a tough, tough skin a bit, right? So there may have been a reason, like a legitimate reason. And if that person is willing to open up and say, you know, well, thank you for that question. Yes, indeed, you know, 20 years ago when I was in grad school, this is what happened. And you will say, oh, I understand that. Well, thank you for sharing that, right? And then you know not to do it. Okay, what else? Okay, I let's see here. Someone else is saying, um, how did they figure out that the duck is the funniest animal? I don't know if you know that, but that is a question there. I would only direct you to the book. I mean, to me, it was funny because when I, when I do this, when I do this kind of workshop and I ask the question, a lot of people say sloth, you know, the animal that hangs because it's kind of funny, right? Well, and apparently the duck, I don't know if it has anything to do with Donald Duck. Actually, I adore Donald Duck, quack, quack. My stalker on my phone is actually Don is not the Donald Duck, but the duck going quack, quack. So, you know, and I'm timing myself. Uh, I don't know. It's the studies. They, the psychologists are funny sometimes, right? Ha ha, no pun intended. But, you know, they study this and that's from the book. I swear, that's it. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> Uh, somebody else said that they have tried self-deprecating uh, humor. Um, six, actually, two people have said they've used self-deprecating uh, humor. One saying it's it seems to help and loosen people up, and another person saying is is saying that um, some folks might think that any sort of ha ha moment is just dis diminishing the seriousness of the process. Oh. 
that's heavy. Why does the process have to be so serious, right? I mean, we are all human and we all have to learn how to relate to each other, be respectful. And I think within that realm of respect, there's definitely place for humor. But remember, timing must be right. So that's why I was suggesting to speak uh, if you're, if you're depending on the setting, obviously, but before you go into the negotiation, mediation or meeting, you can actually ask some questions. If you're thinking that humor might be helpful, you can ask some questions beforehand. So uh, you would not be completely out of, you know, out of place, out of time, all of a sudden. <laughs> Sometimes I have people tell me a lawyer joke. And I don't know whether to laugh or not because it's so out of it. I know about the sharks at the bottom of your Pacific beautiful ocean. So what? Like it doesn't make me laugh. But you know, for some people, ha ha, it's so funny. Well, it is. There's I mean jokes, seriously. That's another area of humor that has been studied for years. And I could go on and on about jokes as well, because there are books written about them and they have impact as well. They do. Anyway, you have to you have to stop me, Julie, because I'm like a I can keep on going. So anything uh, else. We we love you. So we love you. Someone's loving your glasses. And then I see Joe and Les have a question. <laughs> Hands up. Go ahead, Joe and Les. Okay. Uh, I made a comment uh, that uh, uh, we oftentimes note uh, uh, that uh, my wife and I, first of all, uh, co-mediate a lot of domestics. And frequently near the beginning when we're in the process of describing the mediation process and uh, we, we need to share something and, and our two fingers get all mixed up and we're looking at each other or who's gonna type and who's gonna run the, the mouse. Uh, and then Joe will say, you may have noticed it looks like we're married. And that that has a bit of self-deprecating humor in a way. And at the same time sends the message that it's okay to have some disagreements. Absolutely. And it's okay to have some hiccups because errare human est. We are all human. We all can err from time to time. And, you know, I, I am so impressed uh, by um, uh, the relationships that are so long lasting. I'm looking at you, sir, and it, it looks to me like you have been married for quite some time. And it's wonderful. And I think one of the secrets, and again, that's from research on humor, that humor actually is helpful to the relationship. And when I interviewed some people and I have article, um, newspaper excerpts as well from people who have been married for 70 years. I, I don't have it with me right now because I have this very brief uh, presentation, but I read from this. And the couple says that one of the glues, because I say, what is the glue? What keeps you together? You know, there are so many ups and downs in any relationship. And they say, you know, it's the sense of humor. We laugh together. We laugh at each other's, uh, you know, when something happens, knock something off. Or you press something. Say, oh, yeah, you know, and just you can just laugh. You can laugh it off. It's healthy. We know now. We know very well it's healthy. What else? Julie, I think our time is coming to an end. I wish I could be there. But oh, I yeah, we still have about three more minutes. So let's see. I, I'm here. Let me read some other comments. Um, I believe laughter is the best medicine. And I've heard of instances of humor healing people from their health issues, which you shared. And then another comment saying laughter often changes the atmosphere in the room. There's more than one way to encourage laughter besides telling jokes. It usually starts with a smile. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Let's all smile. We are coming to the end. If I don't know, Julie, if there's any way to put more people on the screen. I know how many people do we have? There's been a, over 70, but you have to kind of click through every screen to see everybody, unfortunately. But we've had quite a number of people. Okay. Um, you know, and one, one thought I had about what you're saying about the self-deprecating humor, because I've noticed that in doing presentations as well, that when you tell certain kind of jokes, you don't know who you're going to offend. <laughs> it's very hard, hard to know who your audience is. You can't always tell by looking at someone what their sexual orientation is or what their religion is or whatnot. And you never know how, you, you know, you do something and you could instantly be on their bad side in a mediation. But poking fun at yourself, it's hard to go wrong with that because you you're making fun of yourself and not anybody else. And I, I'm, I'm guessing that's one of the reasons why it's the safest and why Joe and Les's um, strategy of saying that they're married and don't mind us, you know, sort of puts people at their ease or disarms them. 
yeah. yeah. I remember one time I was I was in Memphis. I was uh, presenting for the um, Association for Professional Family Mediators or something like that. Anyway, I I had the microphone and I was it was live. It was pre Zoom people. It was the real thing. And I, I went to the middle, I went and I, I'm holding this mic and I'm talking, nobody's hearing me. Uh, nobody's, you know, and I said, I, I'm looking and they said, well, we cannot hear you. And I look at this, I go, well, it would help to turn the microphone on, would it not? <laughs> and we just were so laughing, it's yeah, such a simple thing, you know. I was so excited about talking to you that I forgot to turn it on. So, you know, we we, we screw up, we are human. We, you know, we, we just have to have enough grace to say, well, I'm sorry, or, or, you know, this was not perhaps something that was called for right now, or, you know, whatever else we can say along that line of self-deprecating. And this is a psychiatrist talking. You know, this is Dr. Goldstein, he's a psychiatrist. In that book, he recommends this. So um, can we smile? Can I invite everybody to smile? And Julie, is there a way to take a picture? So we will have a picture together. That would be so nice, like to have a smile at the end. And maybe um, when I do it live, I ask people to strike a funny pose. And when I when I was <laughs> if people were coming, I was I asked them to come to the front of the room, and everybody was to do something, you know, really funny. And we were just laugh at the very beginning. We were laughing so hard because people I thought nobody would do it. Wrong. Everybody did it, and everybody did something different. You know, and it was it was wonderful. It was wonderful. So may I invite you to smile a goodbye smile? Okay, yeah. I, I don't know how to take a picture of it with my camera, but I'll do it right now. Okay, one, two, three, smile. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank oh, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate you making us uh, smile and laugh uh, more like the 300 times kids do rather than our usual. Please do everyone take a few minutes to fill out our online survey. It does help with our grant funding for this free series. Survey link is in the chat. I'm going to uh, do check your email today or tomorrow. I'll send the link out for the slides, the video link, and the survey link if you aren't able to click in on it. Uh, please, everyone, give a warm uh, Zoom goodbye to Anita for joining us all the way from chilly, chilly Canada. And hope to see you all next month. Aloha. Mahalo. <laughs> <laughs> Mahalo. Thank you so much. Please fill out the evaluation. I always learn from the comments. Please don't have, you don't have to be nice or anything. Just tell me what you think, what I can do better. I'm open to all different kinds of comments. Would love to learn more. Thank you. Take care. All the best to you in 2024. And maybe we'll see you again.